Uh, today we're going to be looking at sort of microservice decomposition patterns, more to the point, monolith decomposition patterns. So patterns that you might make use of when moving towards a microservice architecture. Uh, my name's Sam Newman. I've written a book about microservices, which should be there. There it is. Uh, and um, I also run my own training and advisory firm. If you don't know more about what I do, you can find information on my website. And I'm in the process of actually writing a brand new book called Monolith to Microservices, which hopefully should be out uh, sort of towards the end of the summer. Um, there's more information on my website, and you can see a, you can read an early version over there. What we're going to be sharing, what I'm going to be sharing with you today, is is, um, uh, is some of the themes from that book and some of the ideas from that book. There's a lot more detail here, um, but I wanted to give you a bit of a taste and, and really, um, I think, deal with kind of a fundamental truth about microservice architectures, which is for most people, you are trying to transform something you already have into a microservice architecture. Yeah, it's very rare that you're starting with a blank sheet of paper and you get to think, oh, what should we do today? It's not like that. Often you've got an existing system that's got, for whatever reason, to a state where you are struggling to manage it, or it's not allowing you to do the things that you want to do. And so you're looking to change it. And of course, microservices are very, are very you know, buzzword compliant. And you think, yes, I need some of those. So how do you take what you've got now and move to that world? Uh, and I'm going to be sharing with you a few ideas and a few patterns associated with those migrations today. Because um, this is what we want, right? We want our nice little uh, hexagonal microservice architecture. Uh, and uh, as, as I talk about a lot, one of the main things this architecture optimizes for is sort of reducing the cost and impact of change. And we try and come up with an architecture and uh, a set of deployment practices as well that allow us to make a change to a service and deploy that a new version of that service into a production environment without having to change anything else. This, this facet of independent deployability, this characteristic of independent deployability, is key to what microservices are about. Uh, microservices are an opinionated type of architecture. One of the opinions we have is independent deployability is good. Uh, we might talk about some of the other opinions of microservice architecture a bit later on. Now, now of course, microservices are most often com um, sort of compared to the monolith. Right, and we, we've seen the monolith as the big bad beast. It's the worst thing in the world now. Uh, and uh, I'll pity me. I've got a monolith. You go home and say, "How was work today?" Well, you know, I don't. You know, it was it was tough. We had to we had to deal with the monolith. Uh, it's become like some kind of all-consuming desire to kill the monolith, which I think is a bit of a it's a bit wrong-headed actually. But before we get into that, we should talk about what we mean when we talk about a monolith. The sort of more dictionary definition of a monolith is something that's not divisible. It's something that, that it cannot be broken apart into pieces, which already doesn't really make sense with our monoliths, because most of our monoliths can. But we typically talk about a monolith in the, in the context of the deployment. So talking about normally, we're talking about a monolith as a unit of deployment. So we can think of the classic single process monolith, where we take all of our code together and we bundle it into a single process and that process gets deployed. And that's our sort of deployment topology. It's a very simple deployment architecture. And it normally follows that all of our data is in one big giant database. Um, and uh, just, you know, just want to point out that this is actually a type of distributed system. It's just a really simple one. Right, a distributed system is one where you've got two computers talking to each other over remote networks. And this, this does fall into that bracket. Uh, of course, you'll also be serving data probably up uh, information up onto a web page as well, therefore making it an even more distributed system. So all the codes packaged together into a single process, all the data is stored in a single database, uh, and it's a type of system architecture which has done us very well indeed, and there are lots of companies that have been incredibly successful building monolithic architectures, even if some of them now want to move away from that. Uh, we have variations on this theme, of course. We have the modular monolith which is embracing cutting edge brand new ideas from the mid 60s about decomposition of software. Uh, so where this, in this example, we, our code is still all hosted together in a single process, but the code is now broken down into modules. Those modules can be worked on independently, uh, potentially by different teams, and then we link those modules together to form the running process. Uh, these ideas are sound, this works really well, but it turns out that as an industry, we are extremely bad at doing this. The only way, the places where it does sort of work is when we're working with third-party software. When we're actually pulling and think about all the shared developer dependencies you have, 
that's you're using modules that have had a defined boundary and you link with those modules and get benefits. What we've seen to be very bad at is building a system ourselves that we can decompose into these modules. Um, again, these ideas are not new and it would actually do us quite a lot of good to go back and read the ideas of structured programming and the work done by David Parnas and others in the early 70s. So this is nice, but we still have a sort of typically a single unit of deployment, a single process that we're dealing with. This is highly underrated. For a number of my clients, when they say, should I go to microservices? I say, no, a good modular monolith is probably enough for many people. It gives you some benefits. One of the key benefits that good modular decomposition can bring is the ability for you to have teams working independently on separate models, uh, uh, modules rather. You still have that coordination effort around deployment, but this is still a much more simple deployment topology. It's a much simpler distributed system to deal with. There's another type of monolith we can consider, and that is the monolith which is, say, a third-party piece of software. This could be something you're installing on-premise. This could be like a CRM. This could be SAP. This could be Salesforce. It could be a SaaS product. But a piece of software that has a high degree of configuration and value to your company, but that is effectively something that you buy licenses for, which you can't actively do much with apart from configuration. You can't get into the internals of Salesforce and redesign the architecture of that system. You're sort of beholden to the architecture and the design as laid out by the providers. So there's lots of these are also monolithic software. And, and, and a lot of my clients are actively building their own software to migrate away from these existing systems. And the challenge always is, well, how do I do an incremental migration of effectively what is somebody else's big black box that's arrived in my premises? And there are some things that we can do. The challenge with these types of systems is you typically have much less control or ability to change the underlying system. Uh, some of the techniques we'll talk about a bit later on do require you to have some degree of ability to change the system. There are, though, some things that we can do in these types of situations because most of the time, a lot of these systems will actually expose a database directly, which gives you some ability to do some really dirty things if you want to, which can be very useful. And they often nowadays as well also expose an API, which opens them up for some kind of migration techniques, things like the strangler fig pattern, which we'll discuss a bit later on. So there are definitely things that we can do with the third party monolith, the sort of COTS product, although it's fair to say that you will have more limitations placed upon you in these situations. We kind of have the fourth type of monolith that we need to talk about today, and it's, it's one I suspect many of you have. And in fact, many of the people that claim to have microservice architecture, this is actually what they've got. And that, my friends, is a thing called the distributed monolith, which on the face of it seems like an odd thing to say. A monolith is a single thing, but you're saying it's distributed, so how can it be a monolith? Remember we talk about a monolith as being something that's non-divisible, hard to break apart. A distributed monolith is a distributed system that is so coupled together that you cannot deploy pieces of it independently, and in t in your, what you actually tend to do is deploy the whole thing together. There can be a number of reasons why you might have um, a, a, a distributed monolith. A lot of them have their roots in the, the, the same problems that people have building modular software still crop up when building these kinds of architectures. If you get your module boundaries wrong, if you don't adhere to the ideas of things like information hiding, you can end up with very coupled architecture. You'll see the symptoms of this where you start doing things like trying to roll out very small changes in functionality and finding that those changes in functionality always require changes of lots of parts of your system. Every now and then, even with the microservice architecture, you might have some cross-cutting changes required. But when that becomes the norm, you start moving into a world of having complexity about how you deploy your software. The cost of deploying software drastically increases. The worst situations are when Basically, because it's so hard to decouple this architecture, people say, well, look, let's just release it all together. And so come your next release, OK, we want to deploy one little part of it, but you know, we'll just deploy the whole thing together because that's the only model that actually seems to make sense to us. And doesn't that look like a lot of fun? Doesn't it look like a lot of fun? You've now got 15 different teams all trying to coordinate. Right, on Tuesday morning, we're all going live at the same time. On your marks, get set, go. Well, what do you mean that hasn't worked? Quick, roll it all back, phone the CTO. You know, these kinds of mass deployment activities are an absolute disaster. Uh, and are not much fun at all. We end up having with these systems a very high cost of change and uh, a much larger scope deployments. The larger the scope of the deployment, the more risk there is associated with the deployment, the more chances something is going to go wrong. So this is not good, right? 
A microservice architecture fundamentally is all about trying to make it easier for us to release software and distributed monoliths. They might achieve other things for us, but we have a higher cost of change with a distributed monolith than we would with a single process monolith. Um, and so you may end up with sort of the worst of both worlds. And it's this lovely release coordination activity. Sometimes this comes about because of uh, a lack of, uh, or not getting your service boundaries in the right place. We'll talk about how you do that in a moment. It can often come about because of sort of release practices. So some of you may have heard of a release practice called the release train, which sounds like an exciting form of transportation. Who wouldn't want to have a ride on the release train? Now, the release train actually is a technique that can be quite useful when trying to move organizations towards continuous delivery. The way it works is you set up, you set up say, a, a duration, and you say that every four weeks, all the software we've built in four weeks, we release all together. And the idea is, is that you actually decrease the duration of that train and get to smaller and smaller pieces, and then eventually you throw the, rele the concept of the release train away altogether and move it to proper continuous delivery and release on demand. The problem is that many people see the release train as the goal and the destination, and we now have, of course, formally specified trademarked laminated process maps out there that talk about how fantastic the release train is um, and mentioning no names but you know, this can cause some problems, because now we have many organizations that see as aspirational this release technique. But what it ends up doing is it codifies and enshrines the idea that we should release lots of software together. And even if you don't start off with a distributed monolith, you'll end up with one if you keep doing this for too long. So whether or not you've been told you've got to do safe, do yourselves a favor and only see the release train as a stepping stone onto a lot of much better ideas. This idea of trying to reduce the cost of change is really very important. Um, probably the best summation, I think, of, of the ideas behind, some of the ideas behind continuous delivery were done by John Allspore about 10 years ago now. Uh, this presentation is hard to track down. You can find the slides, but if you can dig out the original presentation, it's well worth it. I think it's available to people who've signed up to the Safari platform. But in two slides, he really distills down the concepts behind uh, continuous delivery. He talks about the cost of change. So here we have a, a long duration between releases. The longer the duration between each release, the more things have changed. The more things that have changed, the sort of the higher the risk of the deployment, the more things there are to go wrong. More importantly, you get your software out less frequently, you have a release process you don't use as often, and therefore there are more things to go wrong. And what sometimes happens in these situations is the release goes badly and people say, right, next time, Let's be even more careful. We'll spend a lot longer over the next release to put some more things in place to make sure we definitely don't make a mistake. The next release takes even longer. There's more functionality. And oh, look, you've got a whole load of problems. Whereas the idea is you want to drastically reduce how frequent, uh, to drastically reduce how long it takes you to get software out. You're looking at lots of small releases of software. This is what we're aiming for. If each release is small in scope, there is less to go wrong. It's easier to reason about any issues you might have. If you have to roll back, it's easier to do. You have the ability to roll forward. Uh, if any of you have seen the Accelerate State of DevOps report, and I definitely urge you to, to read that, it shows very clearly that the most high-performing IT teams in the world, they release software more frequently than anybody else, and they have lower defect rates. There used to be this idea that you either go fast and break stuff or go slow and steady. That's not true. All the evidence now shows us that is not true. Organizations which release really frequently have lower defect rates than organizations that release infrequently. So just work out which side of the equation that you want to be on, because you can have your cake and eat it, it turns out. So if you are in a situation where you've got a release train, try and move away from that. See it as a transitory stepping stone towards better mechanisms for deploying your software. If you're stuck with a release train because of your architecture or your organizational structure, fix those things. But do not see this as a destination, because even if you end up with it, you start with a lovely, beautiful, well-factored architecture, it won't stay that way for long. You know, the distributed monolith fundamentally is not a great place to be. And I have certainly worked in situations where I've advocated merging things back together to properly redefine the service boundaries again before splitting it back out. If you can't find ways to, do, to change these things independently, you may well be better off with a modular monolith. Although I'd suggest if you're having trouble with this, you might find a modular monolith difficult as well. What we're aiming for here, fantastic. 
It's all right. It's not on this stage. Um, what we're aiming for here is, is, is architecture which enables continuous delivery. And that's, you know, that's not surprising to me because I got into microservices because I was originally someone who focused on continuous delivery. How do I help people ship software more quickly? And I realized often the architecture that we, were, we had was one of the main inhibitors. So I started looking at these architectural styles that allows this, that makes it much easier for us. Uh, a lot of this is about uh, is organizational aspects of this, but there's architectural aspects as well. Making this sort of stuff possible, it, it's not trivial work, but it is worth doing. When it comes to breaking down the monolith, though, we've got to think about what we're breaking it down into. And this is where domain-driven design comes into play. So I, I, you know, this is something I think gets understated. There's too much fixation on the technology side of this. There's too many people talking about Kubernetes and service meshes. And, and those things are great and useful, but are really fairly uninteresting if you fundamentally get your logical architecture wrong. Domain-driven design ends up being incredibly useful to us here. Microservices are modeled around business domain. We're looking for high cohesion of business-related functionality. And the reason we want that is because we want to reduce the cost of change. If my business functionality is smeared all over my system, a simple change in functionality may require changes across multiple services. Then I'm back into a world of lots of release coordination and potentially a slippery slide into a distributed monolith. So what we're looking for are ways to, f to group our system logically into components which have high cohesion of business functionality. And domain-driven design is a great way of doing this. Um, the original book sort of on this was the, the Blue Book by Eric Evans. It's a, it's a really good book. I know a lot of people have struggled with it. So I would suggest probably as a starter, I would start with um, Domain Driven Design Distilled by Vaughan Vernon. Vaughan's here at the conference. I haven't had a chance to say hello yet, but I'm sure he's doing some talks. You should definitely go and see him. These would be great introductions. When I'm working with a team to do a, a system decomposition, we starting with the monolith. One of the first things we'll do is we'll say, look, we need to come up with a domain model that represents what the scope of this monolith is. Because the reality is your monolith is just a big mass of code. It's probably what Brian Foote calls a big ball of mud. It is not going to be structured nicely around business concepts. It's going to be something that's grown organically over time, sort of like a fungus. And so we need to bring at least a, a sense of what the logical ordering or modeling in here could be. And so carrying out a domain modeling exercise says, OK, if we think about how people use this system and the mental models they have and the business processes we're operating, we can come up with a domain model. Now, that domain model may not match how the code is organized, but it does represent what it does. And it also represents a model that we would like to use going forward for our services architecture. And so you start to sort of get a sense of, OK, where are the different groupings of functionality inside this monolith? Uh, and I use the, normally use a technique like event storming. And slowly, what, you'll start, what will start happening is out of the ashes of this monolith, you'll start saying, OK, well, these are kind of the groupings of functionality we've got. So in this situation here, we've got invoicing and order management and loyalty management and notifications functionality. And any good domain model will also give you a sense of how these concepts are related. And so straight away, we've got an interesting picture we're starting to build up. We have a logical representation of what our monolithic system does, hopefully as a directed acyclical graph of dependencies. If it's not a directed acyclical graph of dependencies, you have an issue, because circular dependencies are kind of tricky to implement. Um, so uh, yeah, we start to, already we're getting useful information. Because one of the big things we've got to think about is where do we start our decomposition journey? We've got this big monolithic system, and monoliths do not start you know, on day one. They take years to grow, nurturing, huge amounts of investment. You're not going to kill this thing in a week, even if that was your goal. It's going to be a multi-year journey. So you start thinking about, well, how can we bake bright bite off the first piece? This logical model is already giving you some information that makes it easier to reason about where you might want to start. So I look at this and think, well, look, wouldn't it be great if we extracted the notifications functionality? But you realize that looking at your logical domain model, that that is likely to be quite difficult because it's such a core domain concept inside your system. Therefore, it's likely to be a problem to extract from a code point of view. Lots of parts of your system are going to need to use that notifications functionality. So if you want to extract that and rip that 
from the still beating heart of your mainframe, it's likely to have, be a lot of work because you're going to have all of these inbound dependencies that are going to have to be rerouted. Instead, you can start thinking about things further up in the stack that might be less enmeshed in the center of your system and may be easier to extract. So this is quite a useful exercise. And then you should follow this up by actually looking at what the code's telling you. Do these model how far apart are these things? Sometimes the right answer is to refactor your monolith a little bit so that the code more um, adequately represents these ideas. It just makes it easier to move. Um, the challenge, of course, with this is that we can approach this purely from a technical point of view and sort of exclude all understanding or context of our business. Because here's the thing, monoliths are not inherently bad microservices aren't inherently good, and the goal is not to have microservices. Right? Who cares about that? You don't become successful because you have microservices. Your customers do not care right, about microservices. They are, a microservice architecture is something you might choose to adopt because it's going to help you fix some problems that your current architecture can't fit, fix. Right? You're trying to use a microservice architecture to achieve something else. It might be faster time to market. It might be to handle scale better. It might be to improve the robustness of your application. It might be to allow more people to work side by side without getting in each other's ways. Those are the goals. A microservice architecture is just a means to an end. And there are other means to that end as well. So the, the thing you're trying to achieve, the goal you're looking for, will also factor into how you think about prioritizing that decomposition. Because on the one hand, we can think, OK, what is e what's the easy stuff for us to drag out of this system? But you've got to balance that and trade that off against those things you're actually trying to achieve. For example, I might find a piece of functionality that pops out really nicely as a lovely, well-factored service. But it's a piece of code that hasn't changed in the last 10 years. And it just works. And if my goal is to ship software more quickly, why am I spending my time extracting functionality which we haven't changed for ages and have no plans to change? So straight away, you've got to bring that thinking in as well. What you normally end up with is a bit of a trade-off, certainly initially, because initially, you do want some quick wins. You want to get a couple of services extracted, get those things into production, start learning from those experiences as quickly as possible, because um, that's just how we do things, right? And you want a nice, quick win. Um, you want to get confidence, because as you do this, you'll get better at this process. You'll work out the skills, technology, and techniques that work in your context. So you want to adopt a sort of an incremental approach to this journey. So you end up sort of trading these things off. On the one hand, you've got how easy is it to, to extract this piece of functionality into a microservice, and you're trading that off against the benefits of decomposition. And that's what we're trying to deal with. I also want to just pause for a moment and, 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 and just re reiterate a point I made earlier. The monolith has sort of become this, this sort of replacement word for a legacy system. Uh, and so that people are just assuming that monoliths are inherently bad systems. Right? The monolith fundamentally isn't the enemy. Your goal is rarely, if ever, to kill the monolith in these situations. All it is is if the monolithic architecture you have right now isn't working for you, you're looking to change it enough so it does. The vast majority of monolith migrations I've seen involve taking out a small portion of the functionality from the monolith. It's the functionality you care about the most for whatever reason. And quite often, the monolith continues to live. It's just doing less stuff than it did before. The monolith has become a microlith, maybe? Maybe that's for my next book. Not all monoliths are bad. Some monoliths bring us inspiration and knowledge and maybe, you know, kickstart evolution. Who knows? And some, some somewhat questionable uh, makeup. Anyway, right, the key thing I want you to take away from this part of the talk is to, to remember you do actually need a good reason for your migration. If you don't have an understanding about what it is you're trying to achieve, as a result of your microservice migration, it's going to be problematic for you because you will not understand how to prioritize your work. And then you're just like, well, what are you doing? Well, you're just creating microservices for the sake of it. It might be great for the CV, but it's a pointless waste of time, right? So you, what is it you're trying to achieve? And ideally, you should be able to articulate that goal in terms of something that your end users would care about. Once you've got a sense of what you're trying to achieve, you can prioritize it. Oh, it'd be great if we could extract this. This would give us so many benefits here. But oh, look, it's really difficult. And you can use the consultant's friend to help you now. Yes, the quadrant. So here we have a quadrant. And so going from left to right, we've got things which will give us more benefit if we extract them from bottom to top. We have things that are easier. I mean, you start, you just put them out. 
you do some analysis, you say, I'd love to extract this, but it's really difficult. I'd love to extract this, it actually looks really easy. Great, let's pick some of those things. It's really not rocket science, right? And we're looking for these quick wins, things that we could do quickly and easily that would give us some benefit to help us get our releases out more quickly. We're looking for this incremental decomposition. We want to be taking small parts out of our monolith, extracting them, deploying them into a production environment, integrating them with the monolith. A lot of this is a learning journey you're going on. A lot of the learnings from this is partly, yes, the work of extracting the monolith, but most of your education is going to come from running these things in production. That's where the scary stuff comes from. That's what the stuff you can't necessarily prepare yourself for. Get one microservice extracted from your monolith, integrate the monolith and the microservice together, get it deployed into production, sit with it for a bit, and then think about what you've done. And then decide, should we do it again, or was this a really bad idea, right? I get sick and tired of people who extract this, but they take a year out of doing any feature delivery. They, can, they transform their monolith into 150 microservices, and then they deploy the whole thing at once. And I get a phone call saying, Sam, it's really slow, and we don't know what's causing it. And it's like, yes, that will happen, right? Don't, don't get fall into those traps. The, the days of the Big Bang rewrite are over. We can't afford that sort of stuff anymore because our customers want software to be delivered, right? Big Bang rewrites were great when your customers expected to get software delivered once a year or once every two years. You had a year window in which you could pretend you could rewrite the whole system while no one was looking. Now your customers want software to be delivered every week or every day some of the times. So these Big Bang rewrites don't work. And, and as Martin will point out, the only thing we guaranteed with a Big Bang rewrite is a Big Bang. And now look, I love an explosion in an action film. I don't necessarily want Big Bangs in my IT projects. So if we're thinking about a microservice migration, and we don't want these big bang rewrites, we want to keep delivering features to our customers. We have to find patterns that allow us to incrementally decompose our microservice architecture. Because what we want to be able to do is get good at changing our architecture at the same time as actually delivering new features. One of the most useful patterns actually here is a, is a surprisingly simple looking pattern that comes in handy very often. And that's a pattern called the strangler fig pattern. It's actually named after a type of plant. Now I used to live in uh, Australia, I loved living out there. Uh, as many of you may be aware, all the things in Australia want to kill you. The people are nice, right? But all the things on the land want to kill you, all the animals on the land, uh, the, the, the weather, that wants to kill you, the sea, that wants to kill jellyfish and sharks. Even the plants can be quite vicious. This is a strangler fig, it's a type of fig, it's about 12 different species. This is actually a photograph taken in a rainforest in Queensland. And what they do is they take root in the forest canopy, so actually up in the tree line, so not on the floor, but up where all the leaves are, and they extend their tendrils down, they wrap themselves around trees, and they take root in the soil, and over time they grow up and become bigger, stronger vines that start to look like trees. So what we're actually seeing here is the vine on the outside wrapped itself around the tree. Now, once that vine has built itself up enough, it becomes a tree in its own right, and then if the underlying tree it was built on dies and rots away, the tree doesn't care, uh, the, the vine carries on living, looking now like a tree. And so it's sort of this idea of taking an existing structure, in this case, a tree, wrapping the vine around it. The vine couldn't stand up by itself. It needed something else to be supported on. And then once it's replaced it, you can take the tree away if you want. So nature has a way of you know, dealing with these things. So in our software terms, this can also be useful to us because we can wrap, our, our incrementally wrap our microservice architecture around our existing monolithic architecture, allowing us to build on top of the monolith, make use of the monolith, make use of the important aspects of the monolith, but incrementally migrate functionality away from it. And the nice thing about these strangler applications, is uh, these strangler fig patterns, is they work very well, actually, for third-party products, because they can often just work at the API level of these systems. When implementing a strangler pattern, this is a pattern that works generically across other types of architectures. Well, you've got kind of like two building blocks, right? You've got what's called asset capture. This is the process of identifying the functionality that you want to move. So in our case, we would be doing this by doing some domain modeling exercises, saying, okay, this is the functionality that logically now needs to move. And then what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to intercept calls to that old, the old location of that functionality and divert them somewhere else instead. Uh, this is actually written up really nicely over on Martin Fowler's site, and he's the person that sort of came up with this pattern name. Now, when we talk about movement of functionality, 
It might be that you're actually copying and pasting code from an existing system. It turns out that doesn't happen as much as I would like, partly because people have often got to the point where I know logically we do invoicing in here, but the code is everywhere in this monolith, and it would take us weeks to refactor that code to find it, let alone move it. Often as well, you might be changing technology stack as you move to microservice architecture, although I don't like doing that. I would rather, when you do your migration, at least initially, you keep all of your technology choices the same, because I think you've got enough stuff going on, right? If you're a PHP shop, build microservices in PHP for a while before you start trying to change your programming language. So you might be lucky and be able to find the code and copy it, and a copy is the important word, not cut, copy. Often, though, what people end up doing is they rewrite that small piece of functionality. You're breaking down that rewrite, though. I'm only having to rework the piece of functionality that I'm aiming to move. So I've got to re-implement that logical boundary. So giving an example of my, probably the most simple way of implementing a Strangler fig, and this is, uh, works really well with any kind of system that's driven via HTTP. So in this example here, this could be a monolithic system where we're intercepting HTTP underneath the user interface. So calls are coming in from a UI. This also could be a headless application. This could be, actually, I've done something similar to this with Salesforce, where effectively Salesforce is the monolith behind HTTP. So the first thing we're going to need is some kind of proxy. And this is actually something you would do straight away, first release, just stick a proxy between upstream calls and your monolith. And that proxy does absolutely nothing. It just routes all calls through. And we get that into production. The reason we do this, because it's not doing anything functionally different for us, but it's quite important. What we've done is not just given us a place where we can intercept and redirect calls later on, but we're also starting to understand the implications of adding network hops. So in this situation, a call used to come straight into your monolith. Now it goes via a proxy. Now, that shouldn't add more than a few milliseconds of latency to your system. It's a good idea to find out if you've got a really crap network as early as possible. If this increases the latency of your calls by, say, 500 milliseconds, you need to stop because you cannot do microservices on a network like that. Um, one of the clients I worked with years ago, we had whole kinds of performance issues with our system until we realized that because of how the uh, networking was configured, all calls between our services were going via a second country. So I think they're being routed via Luxembourg. Now, that adds latency. That's not good, right? So find that out first. Just pop this in, keep an eye on the request times, run it for a couple of weeks, make sure you're happy. You may already have an existing proxy that you could use to do this for this purpose. It will just depend on who's in control of that proxy. You might want to put your own in so you've got control over what's happening. Next, you start building your service. You can start implementing your service. You can be deploying your brand new microservice into a production environment. You can be testing it in situ, and it is safe to do so because right now, no one's calling it. The calls to that functionality are still being served by the monolith. When you're confident that your new service is ready, you just change the proxy configuration to rewrite the call that was going to your monolithic system, and you route that instead over to your brand new microservice architecture. So this could just be a straightforward proxy configuration. You could get fancy and do this with some kind of release flag system. Although there's a lot to be said with just you know, an entry in an Nginx file. And over time, you can keep diverting more and more functionality away. Now, we have to deal with state. We haven't talked about data and state here. We're going to come back to that a bit later on. Um, but I have used this multiple times to great effect, not just for microservice migrations, but also for monolith migrations as well. An old colleague of mine, Paul Hammond, actually is on a nice write-up of different applications of the Strangler, uh, Strangler fig pattern um, from a number of different projects, if you want to get an overview of where it can be used. Again, one thing I do want to point out here, though, is although the implication of that picture you can see there on Paul's post is that the goal is to kill the monolith, in my experience, it's extremely rare that that is actually the business goal. Unless you've really got a burning platform, like this is a mainframe system and all the people that know how to code in it are dead, right? normally you're just moving enough stuff away until there's a reason to come back and do the rest. The nice thing about these Strangler Figs uh, pattern usage is it allows you to stop at any stage in that migration. And this is also the problem with a Big Bang rewrite. You're nine months into finishing a 12-month rewrite and suddenly your budget gets pulled. We haven't released anything. You've got nine months of just value gone away. But here, if you stop a third of the way in, you've got a third of the value released and deployed, which is really valuable. So the Strangler fig works really well when you've got stuff sort of, sort of up, up in the top of your call stack. Let's see if this is going to work. Yeah, so up here, right? 
So like invoicing, order management, stuff like that. Those are kind of things that, if they're the top of the call stack of your monolith, could be quite easy to grab and intercept. But what about when you've got things that are sort of deeper inside your logical stack? Um, like I can't intercept a call that sends a notification to one of my customers. I can't intercept a call that increments loyalty points in my uh, in my uh, loyalty account because those are sort of done as side effects of other things happening. So if I want to start extracting this functionality, this is when I do need to get my hands dirty. Another pattern that works really well here, again, allowing us to do this in an incremental fashion, is a pattern called branch by abstraction. So branch by abstraction is often used by people who do trunk-based development to avoid the need for branching in source code, but it's really useful here because it opens up some nice, interesting rollout mechanisms. The way branch by abstraction works is first, you've got to create a clean abstraction around the piece of code that you're going to change. So this would require you to do some refactoring of your monolithic system. So you'd be grabbing all this invoicing code or notifications code together and putting it in a box. We sometimes call these boxes classes, which I know some of you might be aware of. Right? So you make it a class or something like that. Then we need an abstraction, a switching abstraction point. And that could be as simple. Um, as basically having that class and then rerouting all the calls into that class. So now, rather than just directly calling out to you know, SMTP servers or WhatsApp APIs, they now come to your nice notifications class to use that functionality. And you know what? Already, if you do nothing else, you've made your monolith better. All right? And maybe you'll be brave enough to make the rest of your monolith better without having to build a microservice architecture. But I'll leave that for you to consider. So now we need the ability to switch between this implementation of the functionality where our loyalty points or our notifications are sent inside our process boundary, are handled inside this monolith. And we need to create an implementation that's going to call out to our services. So once we've done this sort of first step, we then create an abstraction point that allows us to switch implementations. And that could be as simple as having an interface for your class. The current interface of that you implement is the current monolith implementation. So you could call it the monolithic notifications class that implements the notifications interface, if you so wish. So next, you start working on the new implementation. This service calling implementation is really just going to be a bunch of client calls that are going to call out to your service like this. right? At this point, you will be, you'll be checking this in. This is be something you'll be working on while doing other features. You'll be checking this in to the same piece of code. You can coexist both implementations cleanly because only one of them is in the live code path, and that's the existing implementation. You can be deploying your brand new service into production and testing it in situ, which gets a release process you're happy with. And that's safe to do so because it's not yet in the live code path. Once you're happy that the things are working appropriately, you basically just switch which implementation of the abstraction you're using. This could be done, this is typically done with a feature flag. The nice thing, of course, is we haven't removed the old code. If there's a problem, we just flick the implementation back. This could be a, this would normally be a, this might be a compile time flag. It could be a startup time or even a runtime build toggle. There's lots of different ways of making that stuff work. Once you're really confident that it's working well, you might decide you want to, you'd nearly always clean, well, you'd definitely clean up the feature flag once you no longer need it. You may actually, at that point, also decide to remove the old code from the monolith. And now you're shrinking the monolith. Wouldn't that be nice? Like you're starting to slowly chip away that functionality. That last cleanup step is often optional, and many people just leave that code lying around. Now, that process of getting code, refactoring it behind a box, creating a nice abstraction, knowing how to do that well, We've obviously got the refactoring book from Martin Fowler. The, um, the latest edition actually came out at the beginning of this year. It's well worth a read. Uh, but for this specific um, purpose, I'd also recommend probably this book by Michael Feathers, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. It's an excellent book which talks about how you basically refactor code bases that might be a bit old. Michael's definition of legacy code is code without tests, uh, which is you know, kind of valid, and I think it works quite well here. This branch by abstraction pattern, because we can coexist both implementations in the code base at the same time, aside from reducing our merge pain and the need for branches, it also opens up patterns like a parallel run. So with a parallel run pattern, I can execute both implementations in production at the same time. So whenever a call comes in, I send that call to both the existing implementation and the brand new implementation at once. Now, this would be a terrible idea if you were doing this for sending emails, because you do not want to send emails twice. But this can work quite well as a comparison mechanism. The same calls coming in, 
both pieces of functionality are being executed, and you can validate, are they coming up with the same answers? Because this is a true refactoring. We're not trying to change the functionality of the software, so we should get the same answers. I've used this for calculations before uh, in sort of an, uh, an investment bank, where we would run all of our pricing for these certain financial trades in parallel. And at the end of each day, we'd have an Excel sheet that came out with any discrepancies. And then we'd go back and check why were those numbers different. Sometimes we found we'd accidentally fixed bugs. And sometimes our client made us put the bugs back in our new system. But you know, what can you do? Uh, I spoke to a, um, a real estate company up in Switzerland uh, called HomeGate. And they actually did effectively a parallel run like this for, their, um, for the listing upload system from their real estate agents. So they actually run both systems in parallel. With, when you've got both implementations coexisted inside the same runtime, you open up some really interesting possibilities like this to validate that your software is working correctly. And you can even also use it to do quite fine-grained canary rollouts as well inside that monolithic stack. We haven't talked about data and state much. Um, we have to think about that because, well, you know, in this situation, I've, I've taken my I've in invoicing code, I've ripped that out of the monolith, um, but unfortunately, my invoicing service actually needs to access data to do its job. And right now, of course, all the data lives in the monolith, and specifically in the monolithic database. So we've got to think, well, how do I get hold of my data? So, well, one option is just, 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 just go get the data, right? Just go get it. Just directly access the monolith database. Now, I'm, I'm going to assume you're all grown-ups here. Um, this is not a good idea as a long-term strategy. If you're doing it for a couple of weeks or a few weeks before completing the migration, fine. But be honest with yourselves, because if you leave this in place, you'll end up with a distributed monolith. The fastest way to get a distributed monolith is to have lots of services all talking to the same database, because it creates huge amounts of coupling, of implementation coupling. Okay? So this is only something I would count on doing for a very short period of time. Your microservice migration of this invoicing service is not complete if you've got this line in the mix. The reason for this is we like to think about our microservices as being black boxes. The focus is on end-to-end -end slices of business functionality. That means we need to include the data storage. We don't want outside parties reaching straight into our database because it becomes impossible for us to separate what is shared from what is hidden. We now have external parties coupled to our imp internal implementation detail. This is why you start getting into the problems where I make a change here and it breaks someone here. Leslie Lamport says, a distributed system is one where a computer I never heard of stops my computer from, wor from working. And this is a fantastic way of doing this. Have all of your services talk to a database, then go and rename a column and see what happens. Um, and guess what? You'll only find out in production. Uh, so instead, we want to think about services if they want information from you that you hold, they come and ask you for that information via well-defined service interfaces. That allows you to decide what is shared or what is hidden. It also makes it obvious to you as to who your consumers actually are. So none of this backdoor access of databases. Get rid of that. You'll thank me later. And this really, again, is a cutting-edge idea called information hiding that only comes from 1970. Um, so in this situation, invoicing needs some data. So we've got to think about what is the data that invoicing needs. If the data that I need is data that's really still owned by the monolith, so if you think about it from our domain model point of view, um, my invoicing service needs to get information about orders. But orders are still logically managed by the monolith. Invoicing doesn't manage orders. Therefore, it's appropriate for me to go and ask the monolith for the information I want. And so what I need to do is expose some kind of service interface on the monolith itself. In this situation, I've exposed an API, but this could be an event bus or some other projection. So I'm going to go and ask the monolith, please, can I have some of the information I like? And now I'm accessing the database indirectly. And I'm also starting to define a new API here, which could be the sign of another microservice that might want to emerge later on. So this is really useful. So if the data you want is owned and managed by another piece of code, go to that code and ask it to get the data you want. And this might help you start to realize, you know what, behind the scenes here, I think this, 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 there's maybe another service that wants to be extracted. It's calling out to me. Help me, I'm trapped in the monolith. Free me. So then you can get that monolith, and you can see how that might continue. You might then pull that orders service out, and you pull another piece out. It's often what's happening. You start pulling a piece of string, and it also, there's more knots that come out with it.
On the other hand, this is the more tricky undertaking. What if the data you want is actually data you should be owning and managing? If we think about sort of services as encapsulating state machines, the state that needs to change the entire state machine is inside that service. I need my data locally. Please give me my data. Um, well, in that situation, we've got to get the data from here over to here. So the source of truth, the system of record for invoicing related data is now the invoicing service. And so to, it's probably an obvious thing now, we'd need to invert that relationship. We now need to change the monolith to come to the invoicing service for the data it needs. And actually that branch by abstraction pattern we shared earlier would be a great technique to make that work. The kind of tricky bit is that whole, see what I did there is I just did some animations and I made a database split apart. Fortunately, it's a bit more tricky than that. So pulling databases apart is not fun, um, but it is important that you do it. And there's a whole bunch of techniques. I'm just going to run through a couple of example refactorings to give you some ideas about the types of trade-offs that this can cause and, and the challenges you may face, but also show how it is very much possible. So uh, if you're interested in doing some proper database refactoring, um, I think this is the best book on database refactoring because I think it's the only book on database refactoring. It is actually very good though as well. Um, it's sort of the database refactoring equivalent of Martin Fowler's refactoring book. I would also suggest you do this work in concert with any uh, change tool that allows you to define incremental SQL delta scripts that can be version controlled and run in a deterministic fashion. That sounds quite long-winded. Just use FlywayDB. That's the easiest thing. Just go use Flyway and you'll thank me later. Don't, I don't like these database diffing tools for this purpose. I think Flyway is a much better idea. Let's take a look at a, a first example refactoring of a database that we're trying to split apart. So this is our, our sort of monolithic music shop. I've been using the same domain for my talks for a long time. We are still, against all odds, selling CDs online. I didn't claim that we're making any profit, but it's our core business and we're committed. We've decided to split apart our microservice architecture inside our monolithic system. We've identified our catalog-related functionality and our finance-related functionality, and those are going to be our two services that we're going to want to extract. And at the moment, inside the database, we've got the catalog looks after um, its data in a line items table. Um, so this gives you, a, like, you have an ID that says, okay, this, this, this CD is the, uh, the um, uh, Death Polka Hits Volume 2, and it's 15 kroner. So Death Polka is a mashup of death metal and polka. Now, I thought I'd made that up, and I was, did a course in Stavanger last year, and someone started playing me Death Polka, and it, uh, believe me, it's all too real. So uh, Death Polka, the greatest hits of Death Polka, Volume 2, um, and then we've got the ledger, uh, which is where we store our financial transactions. And this is obviously data that the finance code cares greatly about. One of the things that we do is we generate a top 10 list of our best-selling CDs. And the easiest way for us to do this is to effectively do a select where we uh, look at all the records in the ledger for the last week, group them by the ID of the item that's been sold, do a count, sort by that count, we get your top 10 list. Now, if we did that just on the ledger table, we'd come back with just a whole load of IDs. We don't want 10 IDs, we want actually the name of the albums that we've sold. So we would do a join operation. We would join those IDs against the line items table. Might use an ID or something called a SKU, so stock keeping unit. Now, of course, if we're going to make catalog and finance two separate services, this join operation is a problem because these will become two different databases as well. So we have to sever that join. That can't exist. Instead, what we're going to do is move the join up into the application tier. So this is obviously going to have some issues, right? So what we're going to end up with is something that looks a bit like this. So now we've gone from doing one database call and a join done in the database. We're now doing two database round trips, an extra network hop in between, and the join operation is being done in the application tier. I do not mean to offend any of you but I suggest that you will not be able to implement a join operation as effectively and efficiently as people who have been building databases like this for the last 40 years. Right? They've got a lot of expertise in doing effective and efficient joins. So this is almost certainly going to have increased latency. That might not necessarily be an issue. When you split databases apart, often you can make systems faster because you can remove uh, um, sort of bottlenecks and allow for parallel processing. But if you split databases apart and you're joining across that data, this will have an impact. Now, in our case, a top 10 list that we update once a week, who cares? It's not an issue. 
but it might be. So you've got to think about that when you're looking to decompose your um, database. There's more to think about, of course, when we look inside our monolithic schema. Here's our ledger. We have a row. We have a SKU column. That's a foreign key relationship. And that foreign key relationship points to the line items table. Foreign key relationships in a relational database improve the performance of joins, because it, it basically tells the database that these things are connected. You can carry out, uh, you can generate things like secondary indices to make these operations faster. But it also typically will give us referential integrity. It will ensure that we can't delete row one, two, three here from the line items table, because if we do, it will say, or if you try to, it will say, hang on, you can't, that's going to violate referential integrity. So we use our database as a safety net to look for data inconsistency. It's worth reflecting, of course, that when we do that, we don't rely on the database. We normally have our application also stop you from doing these things. The database is just there to make sure you don't do it. Now, of course, when we go to two separate schemas, we have nothing that's going to enforce our referential integrity. So couple, we've also got to ask the question, well, what is our foreign key? Now, in this example here, I've changed the foreign key to a non-opaque URI, which some people might like to do if they're building a REST-based system. So I've replaced that foreign key with actually a HTTP resource that you could directly dereference. Now, I don't know any, anyone that does this. I wouldn't do it probably myself. The reasons, there's a number of reasons. Firstly, splitting databases apart is scary enough without also changing your, you know, rewriting foreign key relationships in the database. Secondly, people are always worried, what if I change how I look up entries in the catalog? Thirdly, in this situation, I don't want to look up one item when I go from the finance service over to the catalog service. I'm going to want to look up 10. So does this mean I'm making 10 separate HTTP round trips? I probably wouldn't want to do that. I want to make one call and pass all the IDs in. So normally, people will just leave this as saying one, two, three. So that then means the finance service now needs to know that when it sees one, two, three coming out of that SKU column, if it wants to get that, the uh, related resource, it's going to have to go and fetch that from somewhere or have that read in from somewhere else. So that's, that's smarts that are now going to have to be up in your application. The other thing, of course, is there's nothing here stopping us introducing inconsistency in our data. So we have some options. Option number one, don't bother. Just, just let people delete stuff in the catalog. Worst case scenario, your top 10 list says, I don't know what this is. But you might have to change your code. Right? So you know, our best seller this week was ID 124, but someone deleted the record in the database. It's probably not great. Option number two would be to maybe uh, implement a cascading delete. So what some people suggest, do, a, do use events and do a cascading delete. So I delete a record from the catalog. I fire an event, and the event gets picked up by the finance service, and I use that to delete records in my financial ledger. If you want to go to prison really quickly, that's a great option. Don't do that. Events code could be useful in a deletion case. If I delete a row from the catalog table, I might fire an event and say, this item has been deleted. My finance service could receive that event and say, ah, oh, OK, it's been deleted. We're going to take that data and store that locally as a historic memory of what that entry looked like. So you could use that to solve the problem in a different way. The really bad option here is, before you delete something from the catalog, check if anyone else is using it. That's a nightmare. Because it effectively is an explicit reverse dependency on every single service that depends on you. So now the catalog needs to know all the other services that might use its information. It needs to be able to go and ask all of them, are you using this ID? And even if you did all of that work, which, by the way, you absolutely should not, it's still not guaranteed to work unless you also lock all of those remote services. Because I could go out to the finance and say, are you using NG123? And you go, I'm not using NG123. I say, great, OK, I'll go and delete the record. And just as I'm doing that, you put a reference on NG123. The only way I can guarantee that would work would be to say, OK, I'm deleting it. Lock your database. I'm going to do my deletion. Now unlock your database. Doesn't that sound like fun? Just say no, right? In this situation, I would probably just not allow deletion, do a shadow delete, solve your problems. The key thing here is, from a technologist's point of view, we can come up with five or six ways to solve that problem. All of them have a business impact. They have impact the way the system is used. They impact the users of the system. And so you would have to have a conversation with your people who use the system to ask them what the right answer is. Now, if this is the first time they've heard about you building a microservice architecture and making changes, they're going to go, no, no, just don't allow that case. But I've got to. Why? Now, 
if you're doing a microservice architecture, you're implementing a microservice architecture to solve legitimate business problems, legitimate problems your users and stakeholders are having, and you've talked to your colleagues about what you're doing and got their input, event storming exercises for coming up with your domain model are a great place to get people on board. Then when you have this conversation, it goes a lot smoother. It goes, do you know how we're splitting apart our systems so we can handle the, our customer load? And I go, yep. Great, I want that. Yeah, I want that too. Well, I need to do that, but this is going to happen if I do that. What should we do? That's a much easier conversation. Um, so you, nearly always when you start breaking these systems apart, you will end up creating some situations where the behavior of the system will change. And you can talk about the trade-offs from a technological point of view, but you're going to need to get input from the people who use the system to understand what the right thing to do is. Let's look at another uh, one last example. I'll skip over the, the static reference data one, kind of give time for some questions. Let's take a look at another one that looks on the face of it to be quite a simple uh, decomposition. So we have here our monolithic system. We've got our catalog code and our warehouse code. This is the much earlier version of our architecture, very simple, basic database. And each row in the database looks like this. We have the name of the album that we're selling, we have the amount, and we have the number of items in stock. Okay? So, so this bit here seems related to a catalog service or a catalog functionality. And the stock level seems very clearly something that the warehouse cares about. And normally what you would do to track this down would be to actually look at how your database mappings are being used. So if you're going through Link or Hibernate, you actually should be able to track about, okay, both of these bits of code are loading this table, which ones care about this the most? Um, can we split along maybe those sort of logical lines? And so this example is quite a straightforward decomposition, and I'm sure many of you who have done this kind of database refactoring in your past. But we, still, we need to consider what happens when, when finance and catalog become a, sorry, when warehouse and catalog become services in their own right. Let's imagine a brave new world where we have three whole services. So here they are, the catalog service, the payment gateway, and the warehouse service. Now, um, when you build a distributed system, you have to deal with the fact that sometimes you can't talk to bits of the distributed system. This could be because the service is actually down. It could be because of a temporary network timeout. It could be because someone's disconnected the cable and all the packets have fallen on the floor, and you've got to stuff all the network packets back in the cable before you can reconnect it, right? These things will happen. With a simple distributed system, you see these, what they call partitions, infrequently. So a partition is where one part the distributed system can't see another part. With a normal monolith, a single process monolith, they happen very infrequently. The more distributed the system you have, the more you likely you are to see them, especially if your network is poor. Could be all sorts of reasons. And you have to think about what do your, should your system do when these partitions occur. Sometimes they're so short-lived that you can just work around them through retries. Uh, OK, a, ne a network timeout, OK, retry that up to three times with an exponential back off in between. That's a standard thing connection libraries like Hysterix and Poly do for you, or service meshes do for you. Or I'll offload some of that by having a message broker to handle guaranteed delivery later on. Fine. So sometimes there will actually be more significant impacts. Let's take a look at our, our organization here. We're selling CDs online, and for whatever reason, we are unable to talk to our warehouse. And our warehouse manages our stock levels, so we don't know what's in stock. We know how much something costs, because that's in the catalog. We can take people's money, because we've got a thin wrapper around Stripe, and Stripe is good, and so it will work. right? This is good, but we don't know if we've got any CDs in stock. This failure mode could not exist with your monolithic system. Because with your monolithic system, either the whole thing's up or the whole thing's down. Now, if we can tolerate this particular situation, then we actually will make our system more robust because we can maintain some operations even when we have failure. If we don't think about this, though, we could end up with a system that will decide what it wants to do without us being involved. Here's the question, though, I'm going to ask all of you. In this situation, we know how much something costs, but we don't know if it's in stock. But we can take people's money Put your hands up. Should we keep selling CDs? Put your hands up. You capitalist but Right, OK, hands up if we shouldn't sell CDs. You naive fools. Right, um, e-commerce companies, they keep selling their CDs in this situation. The reasons actually are quite straightforward. They're business reasons. If I sell you a CD and take your money and then find out I don't have the CD, I go, sorry, I offer to give you your money back or optionally back order the CD. 
On the other hand, if I don't sell CDs at all, no one's happy. I'm not making any money. I can't sell the CDs I do actually have. And guess what? My customers are annoyed they can't buy the CD, and they'll go buy it somewhere else anyway, and they won't come back. So that's why CD companies make that switch. Change the business domain. We're selling concert tickets. You get a very different answer. I think I've got tickets to see a hidden uh, Metallica gig. They're playing in a small club around the corner next week. My friends are flying over from Stavanger and Trondheim. We're going to have a great party. Oh, sorry, you don't really have any tickets. Oh! The amount of pain and suffering to your customer in that situation is dis distinctly different. You can't back order a ticket for an event. So normally, ticket companies in this situation will shut them down because they know you'll come back. Why? Because they're the only ones with the tickets. Right? So different business contexts, you make a different choice. This actually, this trade-off is actually based on something called cap theory. This is as much cap theory as you ever need to know. Cap theory basically says that when you have a partition, you have to trade off between consistency and availability. When we take the money, we're saying it's more important that we maintain the ability to sell CDs. The availability of that operation is more importantly important than having a consistent view of our data. When we don't take the money, we're saying consistency of our system is more important to us than availability of that operation. This is as much cap theory as you ever need to know. If someone ever tells you you can beat cap theory, you can't. Don't worry about it. It's just a common sense trade-off. But again, you're going to have to take your customers on that journey with you. We are over time. I apologize for that. I'm going to happy to hang around for questions after we go off to the side. But thank you so much for your time. If you want to see more uh, stuff, there'll be the slides that will be up on my website later today, and more information about the new book is there. Thank you.